All right. All right, so now we are official recording seminar one for MIP term 2018-2019. And, uh, and everybody is here in the room. I think everybody's here. One, two, three. Yeah, everybody's here. All right. So um, we're going to go ahead and open up and get started with prayer. And then we're going to jump right into uh, the first um, section, which will be introduction and uh, getting to know each other. So let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for this opportunity to be together, Lord, in this training environment. Thank you for giving us the technology that we are able to reach across the miles and to gather together virtually and to, Lord, effectively do training and, and learn, Lord, the practices and the theology of ministry. We thank you for this time, this opportunity, Lord, as we are investing ourselves in the work of the kingdom in the things that concern the name of Jesus Christ. And uh, Lord, as, a, as we start off this journey of MIP, Lord, our prayer is that you would strengthen us, that you would deepen us, that you would enrich us, that you would anoint us and use us for your honor and your glory, Lord. We are not here just to gather information, Lord. We're here to be equipped and to be trained for the work of the ministry in a, in a greater way, in a fuller way. And Lord, we realize that apart from you, we can't do anything. And so we are completely dependent upon you. We ask Holy Spirit that you would come and you would impart revelation to us, that you would speak to our hearts in the areas that need adjusting and fine tuning as we know that you will. And Lord, that you would um, give us a mind that is set on the things above and not the things on the earth. Lord, we commit ourselves afresh and anew to you and to the work to which you have called us and appointed for us, even before time began. Lord, may your will be done. May your kingdom come in us, and may your will be done in this seminar today. And Lord, we want to give you the thanks, the glory, the honor, and the praise in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. All right. Um, so why don't we start? I don't know if your screen looks like mine. Um, kind of go round robin. I'll just start off. Um, cause I know you guys don't really know me that well. And I'm, I'm, you know, it's funny. Uh, I do a lot of public speaking, but I'm not a naturally outgoing person. So, um, little background about me, my wife and I, Lisa, we've been married for 35 years, uh, to each other. Uh, <laughs> have, to, have to mention that. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. We have, uh, I think I mentioned last time, we have six children, uh, five boys and a girl. Um, my oldest son is 32. He is an Air Force captain and an F-16 pilot. He's an instructor down at Luke Air Force Base in uh, Arizona. Uh, my second oldest son um, was in the National Guard, Air National Guard, for about 10 years. He um, he was a linguist. He speaks about four languages, I think, four or five languages. Plus, he is a systems administrator and has a degree in engineering. Smart guy, way smarter than me. Um, my third oldest son, uh, Dwight, is a truck driver. In fact, he just I just saw him about a month ago. And he and his business partner are contracting to do... Um, material moving for hazardous material for Department of Defense. So like they're going to be driving trucks with nukes on them and hazardous waste and all that kind of stuff. So it's, that's pretty cool. Um, my daughter Esther is married and lives in Nashville. She, uh, she's married to a, a longtime friend of hers. They got married about a year ago and uh, he works for big picture productions. He's a videographer and lighting specialist. And so um, his company tours with a lot of big name Christian artists like Toby Mac, Forgotten, or for King and Country. Um, uh, they do Winterfest and, you know, that kind of thing. So that's, that's what they do. Um, I have another son, Gideon, who still lives here locally in Mississippi. Um, he is an artist and currently works at Home Depot, but he's, he's tracking, um, trying to figure out what he wants to do with his life. 
And then my youngest son, Samuel, um, he is Army National Guard. He's infantry. He is currently deployed in the Middle East, and he is also a local Biloxi police officer. Um, so that's my family. Uh, my wife is sleeping on the other end of the house right now, so uh, I'm not going to bother her. We, uh, we have been long-term center directors. Uh, my wife and I, we pastored the Shape Christian Servicemen Center in Belgium for about 11 years, a little more than 11 years. Um, and we've been with ministry to the military since 1990. Um, so we've been around a little bit. Um, I'm currently at Keesler Air Force Base in Mississippi, where my wife and I, we have an outreach to the student population here. This is a technical training base, and there's like 5,000 students here on the base. Uh, no, that's an exaggeration, more like 3,500. They come here straight from basic training uh, at Lackland Air Force Base, and they do their, um, they do their tech school here. And so we have and in with the chaplains, we have some great chaplains here, uh, Pentecostal chaplains, as a matter of fact. And, um, and so we do Thursday night Bible studies with the students. We do Saturday discipleship. Um, we are active participants in the student uh, worship service on Sundays, as well as uh, we attend a local church here in the area as well. Um, we also do an outreach on Wednesdays to, excuse me, um, medical for people that are going through medical procedures at Fisher House, which is uh, kind of like a Ronald McDonald House here on the base. I don't know if you're familiar with Fisher House. Um, so we do that as an outreach as well. Uh, we cook dinner for them. We have a Bible study. Um, plus, I work full time. So we're kind of busy. <laughs> um, so that's a little bit about about me. I came to I came to Christ. Um, when I was still active duty back in, I have to think now, 85, 1985. It was a week before my 24th birthday. Got saved in the military chapel there at Shape headquarters in Belgium. Uh, didn't know I was going to end up pastoring there in that, in that setting, but that's when I came to know the Lord. Wasn't raised in a Christian home or anything like that. I was, I was one of those bad guys <laughs> for a while. And, um, Lord got a hold of me, and uh, shortly after I got saved, I got called to preach and haven't looked back. Um, so that's a little bit about me. It took longer than I expected to. <laughs> so, um, so next, anybody want to jump in there and share a little bit about yourself, and your journey? I'll go. Can everyone? Can everyone hear me? <laughs> yeah. Uh, my name is Kathy Bryant. I'm here with my husband, um, um, Charlie Bryant. Um, a little bit about myself. Uh, we've, well, we've been, we've been married for 28 years, um, almost 29 years. We have three children, two adult children, and one teenage son who plays football. The older child is a social worker in Tallahassee, Florida. The middle son is a first lieutenant in the military station at Fort Bliss. And of course, my younger son, who is starting quarterback for Grotown High School and is doing really, really well. Um, we became um, affiliated with the uh, Minister to the Military in 2011. Um, we started pastoring um, at Cold Pepper Christian Center in Korea. Um, um, and we currently pastor here at Fort Gordon, uh, Georgia. Um, we are passionate about what we do. We love people of God. We are really, really um, passionate about you know community efforts and you know and outreach as well. We do a lot of outreach within the community. Um, and a little bit about myself. Um, I gave my life to Christ at 16, um, so that was many, many years ago. And still um, on fire for God, still loving God and on fire for God. And um, I felt the call of God on my life, um, gosh, about 15, 20 years ago to preach the gospel, to share the good news. And so that's what I continue to do on today. Still in the learning process. I, I, don't, I believe that you never get too old to learn. So each and every day, my prayer is to, to always learn something new. Amen. Good morning, everyone. So, so she gave the family history, so I'll just talk a little bit about myself. Um, like she said, we've been in ministry a long time, and actually um, Bishop Johnson, you know, um, and Bishop Miller um, asked us to take over Cold Pepper Christian Center back in 2016. Um, 
2015, I'm sorry, yeah, 2015. And um, we, we were just honored to um, pastor that, that service over there. And um, we came to, here to Fort Gordon, Georgia. And we, um, the Lord put on our heart, you know, that the plan of ministry here in the Augusta area, because as you all know, this is a cyber center of excellence and there's a lot going on when it comes to cyber and it's a growing area. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of the service members that come to this area. And um, we see that in, in our center here. And it's just a blessing to see the people that go that leaves here and goes all over the world. So we're really honored to be here to be pastoring here in, in Augusta, Georgia. And myself, been in the military for 28 years now. I'm, I'm a garrison sergeant major here at Fort Gordon. Um, so extremely busy mm -hmm. uh, through every day of the week, <laughs> and then also pastoring extremely busy. But um, I um, gave my life to Christ back in 1990 before I joined the military. Um, and so it's been a long journey. Um, actually, was the uh, actually preached a while while I was deployed. Um, I was a lay minister in Iraq for a year over there. So uh, the Lord has really put on my heart to just you know care for His people wherever I go, and that's what we've done. Anywhere we go, you know, from starting with MTTM back in Germany with um, Bishop uh, Edwards, um, and then also Bishop, Bishop Miller, a uh, bit Mitchell. Uh, so we've oh, been yeah. around the team for a while. We really love the people, yeah. uh, the leadership, uh, from Dr. Moore to Bishop Miller. I mean, Johnson, all great people. Um, we really met some great people in this ministry, and we love it, and we will continue to do it until the Lord said, hey, it's time to go home. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Thank you. I appreciate that. I, there, I knew a little bit of that story, but I didn't know some. All, I didn't know all the details, so that, that's good. Thank you. Next. Hello, everybody. So I'm Ashley Keck. I wasn't on the orientation, so pretty much my story will be new. Um, I am a stay-at-home mom. I have, um, I'm married to Josh. We will be married for 10 years in March. Um, we have three boys. We have a nine-year-old, a six-year-old, and a three, two-year-old, or a five-year-old soon. But um, we, once we joined the military, we've been in the military for six years, babe. Yeah, six years. And I kicked and screamed coming to Italy because I didn't understand what in the world was in Italy that I had to go because I loved my church so much back in Norfolk. And we've been here for two and a half years and it's very clear why we are here. Um, we, I, a little bit about myself. I have a stay-at-home daycare, so I watch children, uh, a lot of kids throughout the day. I love to cook, so I also sell food, and I cook a lot for, the pe for people around. Um, I grew up, my family home was not a Christian home, but I literally probably went to every single denomination there was. Um, I always was called to, to God, so I tried out every single church with every friend that I had, and um, stuck with Lutheran for a long time until I met my husband, and then now here we are. So I've jumped in a lot of different type of religion or different denominations, which has really brought me close to God now because I've been able to see a little bit, connect with everybody on different levels and have passion. So that's mostly about me and where I'm at. And I have a strong call for God, um, the people, the body, um, women and children, definitely. It would be something my heart is much for. So that's me. Thanks, Ashley. Okay, who wants to go next? All right, I'll, uh, <clears throat> I'll go next since she went. Uh, pretty much she gave the story of our family. Um, me personally, though, uh, I um, grew up in a Christian home, very Christian home ever since I was born. Uh, and then I decided in my own reasoning that that wasn't for me. I went on about a four to five year hiatus of just doing what I wanted to do. and. Uh, Ashley and I actually almost got a divorce and I gave my life rededicated to Christ and, and I'll give you that as that story at another time. That's a long story, but that's a miracle and testimony in and of itself. Uh, but we're back together now and, and I couldn't think of my life being anywhere else, but concreted and firmly foundation in, in God. So, uh, long story short, we moved to Norfolk. We, we decided that we're going to be all in for God, and we just thought that simple Christianity meant still serving in the church, and we still believe that, but the more we develop, 
the simple Christianity keeps turning into sermons and preaching and teaching and those types of things because nobody else wants to step up. So no, I'm just playing. Uh, we love what we do and we, we educate ourselves daily and, and, uh, uh, soon here, actually, I will have a bachelor's uh, in biblical studies and theology, and I know once I'm done with that, I'll probably just move on to master's and keep going until, again, like uh, Brother Bryant said, until the Lord says, that's enough of that, move on. So <laughs> uh, that's about us. All right. Thanks, Josh. Appreciate it. Um, next. Everybody else kind of quiet, somber-faced. <laughs> Well, I was wondering what took you so long, Tanya. <laughs> okay, so um, I am Tanya Goff. I have been in the military for 19 years. Um, coming up on retirement, I'm so, so excited about that. Um, I am the mother of three. I have um, a 22-year-old, I have a 12-year-old, and I have an 8-year-old. So girl, boy, girl. Um, my oldest daughter is still in the States, uh, kind of living life, trying to figure out what she wants to do. Um, I have been married for uh, 13 years, um, and that is also a testimony uh, in that situation. Um, God is definitely working some things out in that situation. So I ask that you guys keep us in prayer, and I, I thank God for what he's doing. Um, I did not grow up in a Christian household. I was the one kind of like Ashley. I would spend the night at friends' houses just to go to church and things of that nature. Um, and then when I was in high school or middle school, late middle school, we started going to church and I just really felt a call and a tug um, on my life. I was ordained as an elder in the Church of God in Christ um, in 2013. Um, so my credentials uh, for evangelist transferred over for the um, the first part, and so now I'm, I'm doing this part for the ordination. But I just love God. I love His people, and um, I'm just excited to be here. So thank you. Well, we have a similar background because before I came into the Church of God, I was associated with the Church of God in Christ. I actually did a lot of my training, my initial training, and I got saved. That's a whole nother story, how how that gospel service in the in the uh, chapel that I got saved ended up being a Kojic service. And that's that's like I said, another story for another time. But so I, I know where you're coming from. I feel your time. All right. Who's next? Can you guys hear us? Yeah. OK. Um, <laughs> so. Um, I, I was born in a Christian household, but very early on at 14. Oh, I'm Danny and Emma. Yeah. <laughs> on there. A very, at a very early age, uh, I went out into the world and I was there for a long time. I got saved when I was 31 and um, I served in the United States Navy. I was born in Romania, but moved to America. I served there. And for the last seven years, I, I moved to Europe, where I met my beautiful wife. And uh, that's when I gave my life to Christ. Not because of her before that. <laughs> I lived my life, uh, gave my life to Christ. And we were called into to ministry. I was a youth leader for about five years. And Emma was a missionary. Um, she worked with abused women. And... Um, so we we have one son Nathan. We had another daughter Noel, and she died uh, very early. And then uh, that actually got us to change our career. I was a project manager in engineering, and we wanted to go to a theological seminary. We wanted to devote all the time we have to Christ. It it created a whole entire direction. So we went to ETS, the European Theological Seminary. From there we started doing our student practice here at City Mission in Kaiserslautern. Uh, that's where we first got acquainted with ministry to the military. And um, we became, we got ordained here as pastors, with the associate pastors here. And then, um, yeah, during this time we met you guys, Brother Moore, and everybody else that's great in this great place that uh, we love the soldiers. 
We love the people. We are very active in the community with a lot of outreaches. We have bread ministry. Every Saturday we bring bread in the community. We have a clothing ministry where we bring clothing to the people and food bank. And we want more. We want more. We work in a prison ministry and uh, on the base, the military base. And we want to see what Christ has in store for us. So we are here until he says, go somewhere else. <laughs> I keep hearing that theme. <laughs> so I have a question for you, Danny. Um, how did you initially come from your home country to the United States? I mean, was it just from the Navy or were there other circumstances? No. Um, so 89, when the communist regime fell, I was nine years old. And right afterwards, we moved um, early January, March 1990. We moved to Austria, to Vienna. My father is a bishop in the Church of God. And he, <laughs> he got transferred and he pastored a church in Sacramento in California. And that's how we moved to the United States. Ah, there's the, there's the link right there. Okay. That's, that's what I was wondering. In Sacramento. And I went to go. Okay, that's cool. Because I was like, okay, did he just wake up one morning and say, I think I'm going to go to America and join the, the Navy? Uh, no. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Okay. I guess that leaves just the Tolberts to share. Y'all been quiet. All right. Go. Hello, everyone. Um, well, you weren't there, so... Um, a little bit about me. Well, uh, um, I was born and raised in a church, so I was honored to uh, know Jesus at a very, very early age and accept him as my personal Lord and Savior. Um, I grew up in a very, very, very strict household. So, um, yeah, but uh, I knew I knew at a very early age that I had a call in my life didn't know it was going to be in this direction of ministry. I was very comfortable working in all of the areas. Um, I've held a lot of positions in church. Um, I met my husband back in 2008, I want to say, at church. And um, we've been together for 10 years this year and married for five. So, um, when we got married and moved away to Quantico, Virginia, that was uh, our first duty station together. Um, that's when I really, really felt a call on my life to the ministry. Um, I really didn't know what God was calling me to because I was already active in the church. I really have a heart for praise and worship. I have a heart for children's ministry. I really have a heart for God's people in general. Um, so I was working to the best of my ability, but everything wasn't working out right and I took God taking everything and everyone away from me for me to stop and realize that he was trying to tell me something and he wanted me to go in a, a different direction and um, when I finally got that message uh, <laughs> and allowed him to do what he wanted to do uh, that's when we got orders to uh, um, to Spiganella. And when we got here, it was prophesied over us that this duty station would be a monumental one for us. And um, I didn't know what that meant. Well, kind of did, but I kind of didn't. But um, since coming to New Hope, um, we've been very active in the church. And uh, Pastor was asking if anyone had the call in their life into the ministry. And we answered and said yes. So we've been who's on the ground running ever since and um uh we don't have any children yet we're praying so keep those prayers coming in baby vibes um and we have orders to japan and we leave uh next may so right after graduation which we will be attending in jesus name um we will be heading over to iwakuni japan so uh, it's a little bittersweet because we will be leaving all of our Spartans and loved ones here, but um, it's not a coincidence that God brought us here. He equipped us with everything that we need and sending us over there to where I don't believe they have anything 
in place. So um, God is intentional. He does everything for a reason. So I truly believe that that's the direction that my ministry, our ministry is headed in. Um, that's pretty much it for me. Hello, y'all. Um, we had a we had technical difficulty, so we had to lead a group. Um, so uh, I was born in Albany, Georgia. Um, I have nine sisters and five brothers. I'm the second oldest. Um, same mom and dad, by the way. And uh, um, once I left the house, I went to college for two years. After that, I joined the uh, best gun club in the world, United States Marine Corps. Wow. Uh, the Marine Corps has taken me all over the world. I served as far as uh, Beijing, China, Tokyo, Japan, and then uh, Cairo, Egypt, serving in the embassies. Uh, we were stationed, well, throughout my tour overseas, my first tour at, at, at home at least. Um, I wasn't married. We couldn't get married on the program. So she waited for me for three years. And once I got back after serving overseas in the embassies, uh, then we went to Quantico and then got married. Uh, we stayed there three years, got orders here. Uh, it seemed like a mistake at first, but I thank God that he strategically uh, does things even though we think it's, it's, uh, it's by chance sometimes. But, um, like my wife said, we got here, boots on the ground, and I didn't even hesitate. I know there's some things that God needed to work out in my life at the time, but in doing that, he instructed me to, to stay uh, stay available and obedient. And since then, we've been, we've been working in the church, so whatever needed to be done, I felt like <laughs> it almost seemed like I was a workhorse. And I know lately, you know, I was talking to God and asking him, you know, like, is that is that all I am, a workhorse? So I, I'm I'm trying to stay before the Lord because um, the fall conference definitely was a, a blessing as far as, you know, um, asking God to, uh, you know, anoint you. You know, and there's some times where you need a fresh anointing. So I feel like lately God's been definitely giving me a fresh anointing. Um, and I really... I really appreciate him for that. I'm also I'm training for a marathon right now, so that's why I, that's why I was I've been quiet so far. I ran a 20 miler this morning. I'm a little tired. Hope I don't fall asleep on you all. But if I if I get up, that's because I'm a little sleepy and I need I need to stand up. But yes, we have orders to Iwakuni, Japan next, and I feel like this MIP uh, journey is is preparing us for Ibu Kuni because I, I, I know that there's nothing on the ground right now as far as like that solid doctrine that, that the service members use. Sounds like you're going to be spearheading a, an effort there in Japan. That's awesome. That is. That's, a, that's, a, we, that's, what, that's, what, that's what this is really all about. It's about us being on the cutting edge of military ministry, uh, going where I can't say where no one has gone before, but to be able to bring full gospel, spirit-filled Pentecostal ministry everywhere where there's military people. That's what we're all about. And, and, uh, and I'm thankful that all of you have given yourselves to that. So, um, so let's, let's do this. It is now, yeah, we've been going for about 30 minutes. Um, I want to take just a five minute break and then we'll come back and we will jump into, um, the first part. We'll go through the declaration of faith, uh, the first and second articles of that. And, uh, by the way, if you looked at the link on Facebook, um, that listed the topics of discussion for today. So, uh, there's a, there's been a correction on that. Um, so we're not going to be dealing with prayer and worship today. We're going to be dealing with discipleship. Um, I got turned around and got the wrong syllabus. So um, 
So forget what you saw on Facebook as far as the topics are concerned. Um, and we're going to try and go through this in fairly quick order. Um, you all are already familiar with the Declaration of Faith. So the first two parts, we should just be able to breeze through pretty quick. Uh, Y'all good with that? Okay. Um, so let's take five. Go get some water if you need to. Go to the bathroom, whatever. And we'll come back here in just a minute. All right. Sorry, I had to start the recording again. This is like, I got I to gotta get this thing going here. So we're starting the recording again, sec, section two of uh, seminar one. So we're going to start with the Declaration of Faith, article one. Here we go. Can everybody see the screen? Okay, good. All right, so we are looking at Article 1, which states that we believe in the verbal inspiration of the Bible. The term inspiration, when used to describe the Bible, means that the Old Testament and New Testament owe their origin to the creative work of the Holy Spirit, and that Scripture is a product of the creative work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, one of the things that we know is that God inspired the Old Testament uh, in the Old Testament, it's clear that God spoke through his servants. We see that in Hebrews 1.1, 1, 1, where God at various times in a different manner spoke in times past by his servants. The prophets has in these last days spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. So that's Hebrews 1. Uh, let me see here. Uh, even Jesus affirmed the fact that the Old Testament was inspired when in Matthew 15, he talked about transgressing the commandment of God uh, through the commandments of men and traditions of men. Um, so he affirms the inspirational nature of the Old Testament. Um, God also inspires the New Testament. I think we can all see that in John 1.1. 1, 1, uh, the scripture says that in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. And in Second Peter, we are familiar with how that, how that um, all scripture uh, has been given by God. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that Paul says in Second Timothy chapter 3, a familiar passage of scripture to you all, where it says that all scripture is uh, given by inspiration of God or God breathed. And is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly finished, or completely fitted for every good work. Um, so, anybody got any questions so far? All right. Um, one of the things that we need to remember is that God inspired not just the ideas of Scripture, but the very words of Scripture. Um, excuse me. I've got a lot of notes. When we talk about uh, that God has, that in our, in our Declaration of Faith, we talk about that it's the verbal inspiration. We believe in the verbal inspiration of the scriptures. That word verbal talks about um, not just the ideas, but the actual words. Um, I'm reminded of a scripture. This is not in my notes. I'm reminded of a scripture in Galatians 4. You might be familiar with that, how that when Paul is uh, telling the church in Galatia about the, the doctrine of faith as opposed to works. He makes an important point based on the singularity or plurality of a one word in the Old Testament. You remember he uh, talked in Galatians 4, 
he says to Abraham and to your seed where the promise is given. He says it's not to seeds as of many, but to seed as of one, meaning Christ. So he makes this whole doctrine, this whole uh, theological point about the fact that the, the promise belonged to a single individual based on the singularity or plurality of a word in the Old Testament. Uh, so that seems to, under, to me anyways, it seems to underscore the point that God um, not just inspired the words, or not just by the ideas, but the actual words uh, of the writers of the scriptures. Um, the writers of the scriptures, as you know, were not just typewriters. They weren't just di taking dictation, but God breathed through them and, and used them and their personalities and their experiences and the, and the context in which they lived uh, to pen and author the scriptures. And we believe that, we receive that. Um, in order to understand the message of God, we need to look at the scriptures and interpret the scriptures uh, where there's poetry, where there's symbology. Um, we need to look at it as you would look at any other uh, literary writing. If it's poetic, then we look at it as a poetic writing. If there's symbology that's used, then we uh, understand it symbolically. Um, and one of the things that I always tell folks, and we'll get into more of this when we get into the discipleship part, uh, is that scripture interprets scripture. Um, we don't, we don't try to think as they do in some mainline churches that everything is allegorical and nothing is literal. Um, we believe that the scripture teaches us in and of itself, how we are to understand the scriptures. And so that, that presupposes that we're going to take the time to study, to learn the scriptures, to understand things in context, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so that's important for us to know and to understand. Um, we need to understand what the intentions were of the authors of the scripture, you know, what their purposes were, the circumstances, to look at things in context. And, uh, and I think we all understand that we have, you guys have a plethora of experience and training. So anybody got any questions about that? Yes, no, maybe so. All right. Okay. Let's see here. How am I going to do this? Hang on one second. Technical thing here. Okay. So did every did that work out okay? I'm I'm checking the technical part here now. Did it, did that work out okay? Could everybody see the the PowerPoint slide and you could see each other and all of that? Is that all good? All right. Okay. So let me see. We're going to go to. I can find my mouse here. All right, we're gonna go to section two or article two. All right. Excuse me. So now we're looking at Article Two of the Declaration of Faith, um, which says that we believe in one God, eternally existing in three persons, namely the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Uh, so, a personal note, and Tanya, you might you might relate to this. Um, when I when I first became a Christian, uh, the the gospel service that I was a part of was going through a transition. Um, the pastor that was there was part of UGF, United Gospel Fellowship, which is a oneness denomination. They don't believe in the Trinity. Um, is everybody familiar with the, the doctrine of oneness? You know what that is? Yes? Okay. Sort of, kind of. Um, they basically turn the Trinity upside down. There's not it's not three and one, it's one and three, and just it gets into modalism and all that kind of stuff. So anyway, that was the environment in which I got saved. The pastor had left, and the, the deacons and elders of the church were praying for their pastor. Well, God sent them a pastor. He sent them a Kojic pastor. And Church of God in Christ is Trinitarian. And so you had this 
this battle going on here uh, of doctrine within the church. So the pastor at the time, I thought he was very wise. Uh, whenever somebody got saved and we had a baptism service, you had people that wanted to baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You had other people that wanted to baptize in Jesus' name. If you know that, that argument goes back and forth. So the way the pastor solved that in order to keep unity in the body, whenever somebody would baptize, <laughs> he would say, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost in Jesus' name. And it would be done. <laughs> I, I, I don't know whether that was right or wrong, but it worked. <laughs> because, you know, to be quite honest, and this is my personal view, uh, it's not a formula. We, when you do something in the name of someone, you do it with their authority, with their backing, with their, with their power. And so whether you do it in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, obeying the scripture in Matthew 28, or whether you do it obeying the scripture in Acts 2 in the name of Jesus, I really don't think God cares a whole lot so long as you start obeying his word and following him with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. I think that's the important part. So that's my little soapbox. You, I don't know, Tony. Did you have any any similar kinds of things in the Church of God in Christ when you were part of that? You're muted yeah, still. It, it, was, it was definitely similar to that. Um, just the whole argument of who, how to do it, and you know, the the Trinity was definitely very big. And uh, so, yeah, I can relate. Okay. <laughs> Well, in the Church of God, we are thoroughly Trinitarian, um, and I think for very good reason. Um, we believe in one God eternally existing in three persons, namely the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, I don't think that there's any problem with you guys in terms of the Trinity and understanding that, but we have to admit that the whole doctrine of the Trinity has an element of mystery to it. If you ever try to explain the Trinity to someone, it always seems like every analogy that you could possibly think of, at least in my opinion and my experience, I think it seems to come really short of what actually takes place in the Godhead. Um, but one of the things that I think is important to remember and this is just a theological thing. We believe that God is omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent. We believe that God is transcendent, eternal, um, that there's nothing that can be added to him or taken from him. He is above all things, created all things. He is the all-sufficient El Shaddai God. Um, there's nothing that he needs or has not had or experienced that that you know that we go through that he's not already aware of so for me like when i i would encounter people that hold a oneness uh doctrine or hold a hold that kind of, of theology one of the questions that i usually ask and i kind of came to this through a series of, of studies and, and confrontations with different people um so if we believe that and and Oneness people, they believe that as well, you know, that God is all sufficient and everything. If in eternity past, if there was only one person, one single personality within the Godhead, where is the, where is the experience of community? Where is the experience of family? Where is the experience of relationship? Um, that would be missing until God created someone for whom or with whom he could have relationship, if there's only one personality. For me, that, that kind of settled it. Um, as far as understanding the Trinity, that God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit have eternally been in relationship, community, fellowship with one another. I can't, all, I can't fully wrap my head around that, but I accept that and I believe that as the teaching of Scripture. Um, because when you look at the fact that God created us in his image, we are built for community. We are made in families. Family is the, is the idea of God. He didn't just pull that out of a hat somewhere. That is part and parcel of his very essence and his core, who he is. Um, 
that whole idea of unity and relationship and, and fellowship and family, all of that is essential to the nature and character of the Godhead. Um, that's not possible if there's only one person. Does that make sense? Does that, do you, does that sound like sound theology? This is just me. This is not Sly. This is me. Um, so I think that's, I think that's really important. One other thing, and we'll get into the slide, you know, in first Corinthians chapter 15, uh, when it, Paul is talking about the doctrine of the resurrection, he says something very important. He says that when, when, when all authority and all power has put under the, has been put under the feet of Jesus, then Jesus himself will subject himself to the father so that God may be all in all. That presupposes order and rank and relationship and all of those things. If there's only one person in the Godhead, that makes no sense to me. To have, how do you subject yourself to yourself? You know what I'm saying? These are just my theological ramblings. I, I just wanted to kind of share that with you. If you ever have to talk to somebody or, or you know, as a, as a minister, as a bishop, if you are trying to, uh, you don't want to wrangle, you don't want to argue with people, but to be able to present your doctrine, present your, 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 your belief uh, with reason and be able to articulate that from the scriptures is important as a minister of God, as a minister of Christ, to be able to give a reason for the answer an answer for the reason of the hope that's in you. So, uh, so that was free. All right. So here we go. Back to the slides. Uh, we believe in one God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are one God. The Bible affirms that God is one. And when we say one, we don't necessarily mean one in in a, in personality, but we one in terms of unity. If you go back and you look at the um, at the Old Testament in Ezekiel, where God tells him to take two pieces of wood and join them together, y'all familiar with that? Um, the word there in the Hebrew is the word I think it's eshod. I'm trying to pull this off my memory, and it refers to the unity of the Northern Kingdom and the Southern Kingdom, at least in Ezekiel's context. But that word is that word one is the same word that's used when speaking about the Trinity. Uh, it is one in essence, one in purpose, one together in the same way that a husband and a wife are one, yet two separate people, yet they are one. That's a picture of the unity that is present in the Godhead. God is one. The Old Testament writings serve as witnesses to the existence and the unity of the Holy Trinity. Um, let's see here. So you hear, you, you hear in, in the, the grammar of the Old Testament writings when God refers to himself or the prophets are writing, to, writing about the Trinity, they use oftentimes the plural forms of the verb or plural terms in referring to God. Perfect example is um, Ezekiel, is Ezekiel, no, it is Isaiah chapter six, where um, God is speaking. He, he reveals himself to, to, uh, to the prophet and uh, he says, who will go for us? Whom shall we send? And uh, so that word uh, refers to the plural. Even from the very beginning of scripture, Genesis 1.1 talks about how that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Those of you who know your, your Bible, and all of you do, know that that word where it says God is not the word El, which is singular in the Hebrew. It's Elohim, which is plural. So from the very beginning, the plurality of the nature of God is shown in the scriptures. Uh, so right up front, we, we see that. Uh, and there's many, many other scriptures. You can go to Job 33, Isaiah 48, Micah 3, Zechariah 7. If you want this list of scriptures, I can give it to you. Um, but 
throughout the Old Testament, uh, the writings of the prophets testify of the plurality of, uh, of God, yet God is one. Deuteronomy 6.3, the Shema, the, the uh, Jewish statement of faith, Behold, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. It showed one. New Testament writings serve as witnesses to the existence of three persons who have who each have distinct roles and work in unity as one God. So it's not just in the Old Testament. The New Testament, of course, has that as well. <clears throat> um, there's a scripture in Acts. This is not in my notes, but there's a scripture in Acts. I'm trying to remember. It's Acts 4. Normally, I'm pretty good remembering scripture, but this one is escaping me at the moment. Uh, I can quote it, but I was trying to remember the reference. It says how that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost with power who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil for God was with him. Y'all familiar with that passage of scripture, right? Nod your head. Shake your head. Do something. Because <laughs> everybody's muted, so I can't tell if I'm... I'm... Can, can you say it again? I'm sorry. Uh, somebody looked this scripture up. I think it's Acts 4, 12. No. It's uh, how that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. So in that one passage, you see the Trinity and their roles and responsibilities illustrated. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. So God is the anointer. Jesus was the anointed. The Holy Spirit is the anointing. That's uh, Acts 10 and 38. Thank you. The Father is the anointer. The Son is the anointed. That's, by the way, you all know, Jesus, who is the Christ, or who is the anointed. He was anointed with the oil of gladness more than his, all of his fellows, his companions, because he loved righteousness, hated iniquity. He is the anointed of God. The Holy Spirit is the anointing. The anointing which you have of God abides in you. You don't have any need that anyone should teach you. That same anointing that abides in you teach you all things. So he is the anointing. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. What was the reference again? Acts 10.38. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, we, see the, we see the Trinity again revealed in uh, Jesus' baptism in Matthew chapter 3, how that when he came up out of the water, the Bible says that uh, the Holy Spirit descended on him like as a dove and a voice came out of heaven saying, this is my beloved son whom I'm well pleased. There again, you see the father, the son, the Holy Spirit. Uh, and we can go through lots of, of scriptures. Um, I can give you those references if you like. Um, so anybody have any questions? Okay. No questions. All right. So, everybody good? All right. So, we're going to move on to the next. Like I said, I want to try and get through this uh, fairly quickly. So, we're going to get into discipleship. We want to talk about the meaning of discipleship, the motivation of discipleship, and the multiplication of discipleship. So, what I'll do is uh, if, if you look in your book, these, the outline for these are in seminar six. Um, if you don't have the outlines for these, uh, if you have your book, you can just go ahead and follow along with the outlines, but if not, I will, I can upload the PDFs for those and, uh, get those to you via Facebook, send you a link for that. Um, how many of you have those available with you right now? Okay, that's one, two.
so like I said, we got I got kind of shifted around a little bit. Um, so we're going to cover discipleship today. So before we get started with the slides, I'd like to just ask a question of everybody. Um, can you think of a particular experience that you've had in your ministry um, that stands out to you in terms of discipleship? In other words, maybe somebody that that you really knit with or you spent a lot of time with and you purposely uh, went to disciple them and, and they stand out to you as, as a significant um i don't want to say project that sounds sterile um you know just somebody that you really bonded with and were able to help and you could see their growth in their process um can you kind of relate that a little bit just maybe like in a minute or two uh, anybody want to share something like that i'm asking the question because i really don't want to do all the talking <laughs> Well, I, I'll, I'll say one. Um, I don't think that it started out as discipleship. It was uh, a young lady. She was actually a Jehovah's Witness. And um, I was in Guam and I, I was in a church and there was a, a lot of us. But, you know, as people start leaving, you're kind of now by yourself. So I think she took that as an opportunity to kind of, I don't want to say attack, but kind of like do what she wanted to do as far as her witness and um there began a process of her trying to I think win me over to what she believed and so I began to open up the word and just kind of show her what I believed and she eventually was won over to Christ and from that just kind of walking with her and uh teaching her the different uh principles and the different foundations um to where now she is a strong Christian and she's serving God and her family is serving God. And so she was able to then witness to the rest of her family who's all, who was also Jehovah's witness. So I think that that was um, part of the discipleship um, unintentionally because it, it wasn't, I didn't seek out to, okay, this is what I'm going to do, or I'm going to teach her the things of God, but that's kind of how it happened uh, in her trying to win me over. I was, a, I was luckily strong enough to know the foundations and know what I believed that I was able to, uh, give her those different tools and things like that. So we started doing um, Bible work and stuff like that. So that's, that's one of my stories. Well, that sounds like it, everything was centered around the word, yes. the, the whole relationship and your ability to help her and help her change was centered around the ministry of the word. Yes, sir. Okay. Anybody else got something they want to share real quick? Yeah, so Emma and I have been youth leaders in Graz in the church. We've, um, we've connected very well with the youth. We're very, very tight. So a lot of the young couples that were married, our door was always open. So we had dinners and game nights and everything else in our house. There was at least 12 people a night there. We didn't know at that time what that meant for them. Um, because he was just pouring out of us and it was fellowship, discipleship to fellowship. And so many questions arise. We had many discussions from the word. We had discussions about life, about marriage, about everything else. And uh, what really touched our, touched our lives afterwards, after we had left Graz, how many of these couples or how many of these young guys and girls called us and told us how much we've poured into them. So we only realized that we, it, it really encouraged us afterwards. And um, yeah, it's been a lot of my in the ministry right now. And it's really amazing to see how God moves in their lives. That is, you guys, you guys have hit on the core of everything we're going to cover over the next three uh, sessions here. Uh, between the two of between 
you know, Tanya and Danny and Emma. I mean, I, I would like to hear from everybody else if you have something to share, but that is basically the core of discipleship. It has to do with relationship and it's centered around the word. That's, that's it in a nutshell, really. Um, and you guys are already doing it. Uh, anybody else got a story that they want to share real quick? I'll share. Um, discipleship is just something that we're just really, really passionate about because we've seen time and time again how relationship and the word of God change people's lives. Um, one instance, uh, one, um, not, and I can uh, this lady is that just came into the church and um, had kind of lost her way. And, um, and um, she was going through some troubles in her marriage. And to make a long story short, um, after um, several meetings, sharing the word, her coming to Bible study, then she began to learn. It's like the word exploded in her to the point where she just wanted more. And so that led to her giving her life to Christ. It led to her uh, being baptized um, in the Holy Spirit. It led to her being baptized of the water. And even though she has since moved on, she now is witnessing to other people um, about what she's gone through and how the word of God has changed her life. So that's just, just one. Um, and I'm so excited about this young lady because, you know, when we disciple others, when we take the time to disciple um people, they'll go out and take what they've learned and go in and, and, and continue to disciple other people. So it just continues on. So I'm excited about discipleship. It's something that I'm passionate about and I always have been. So I'm excited to, uh, to, to, to sit here and just learn more about it. Well, y'all could probably teach me a few things. <laughs> uh, I am I, I'm all about discipleship. Um, small group ministry is kind of where I function. I, a, lot of pe a lot of people are preachers, you know, to large crowds and, you know, they, they function well in an anointing in a larger venue. When, when we were pastoring, um, the one thing that, that stands out to me, and, and you guys have all hit on that, um, we had a, a center director uh, in K-Town, this was, this was several center directors ago. His name was Brother Ronnie Hatcher. Um, I don't know, you may have, you may have heard of, about him, Danny and, and Emma. Um, this was when uh, the Kaiser, that's when the K-Town Center was actually downtown in K-Town. It wasn't in its current location. Um, and he, he used to talk about the magic of midnight. Uh, he said, God doesn't really do anything until after midnight. Of course, he's being facetious. But it, it illustrated the point, you know, we would have young men come over. I like working with the, with the young men. Um, and they would come over and they would sit in my living room until two, three, four o'clock in the morning. And we would just sit on the floor and we would just discuss the word and go back and forth. And the Holy Spirit would just minister and, and, and fill these young men up. I mean, some of them, I'm still... 25 years later, I'm still in contact with them. They're doing great things for God. Um, and I'm seeing that again, even with our outreach on the base at Keesler. Um, quick story. Last week, I was, quite honestly, I was a little discouraged. Um, went to the fishbowl like I normally do. Nobody showed up. I mean, it was like crickets in there. I'm like, okay. I mean, I've been in that place before, but you still kind of feel, you know, okay, why am I here? And then uh, the next week I said, and this was this past Thursday, I said, okay, Lord, I hope nobody, I hope, I hope it's not a repeat of last week because I don't want to deal with that again. So I just began to pray, sitting in the car waiting to go into the building. I just began to pray and said, God, you know, I just want to be an instrument. There are all of these students here that, and most of them don't know you. Lord, give me, give me something to work with. Give me something to work with. So I went into the fishbowl and the area where we meet for Bible study, there was a young man in there who was on the phone talking. I'd never met him before. And uh, uh, so I tried to give him his space, let him finish his phone call. When I went in, uh, I started to get the room set up and he was like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm in your way. And uh, I said, no, 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 you're all fine. You're fine. You're fine. We, I'm just getting set up for Bible study. We have Bible study here. And he kind of cocked his head and looked at me and said, Bible study. I said, yeah, we're going to have a Bible study in here. And he said, you know, 
I was just thinking about that because, you know, I was, and he began to pour out his heart. He said he was raised in church and got away from God and all of this stuff. And he was like, I didn't know what to do. I was looking for some direction in my life, some balance and all of this kind of stuff. I said, well, you're in the right place at the right time. And he came to the Bible study. And then all of a sudden, the room got full of people. People just started coming in left and right. And we had a full house in the Bible study. Everybody was between 18 and 22 years old. And I said, Lord, that's, that's, that's the group I want right there. The young folks. I want to be able to pour into these guys. Some of them came from Christian homes. Some of them didn't. One of the guys there got saved in basic training. And this is like his first foray into the Christian life. And I'm like, yes, this is where I want to be. I want to be able to pour into people's heart, even if it's just for a few weeks, a few months, and get them solid in the word, get them solid in fellowship, um, help give them the hope that's in Jesus Christ, and to and establish them in the truth of the gospel. That's what I'm all about. Um, so it sounds like you guys are already there, so I'm not going to try and, you know, inject you with with what i have you already have it god's already working in your life so we're gonna go through this um if at any time during the I'm, I, i'll be honest with you i don't like to kill people with powerpoint but i just want to run through this if at any time y'all have a question a comment something you know raise your hand do something and uh and we'll discuss it okay and some y'all making me nervous y'all are a quiet bunch <laughs> all right so uh here we go um right so we are looking at the meaning of discipleship let me get my notes here all right so discipleship begins continues and ends with the journey of a person with the person of jesus christ discipleship is really about a journey a journey of following jesus christ personally in an intensive, special, and intimate way. In more direct terms, it can be stated simply by the initials WWJD, that is, what would Jesus do? I think better would be WDJD, what did Jesus do? So we follow that instead of trying to guess what he might do in a situation, well, what did he actually do? <laughs> That's just me. Answering that question helps one to focus on the meaning of true, dis on the true meaning of discipleship. Thus, a disciple is, first of all, a learner or an apprentice. Second, a disciple is a follower of someone else. Third, a disciple is an imitator, one who copies the example of his or her master. The foundational verse is found in Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 through 30. Here's what Jesus said about discipleship and following him. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This passage contains three commands or, or three verbs, come, take, and learn. It really, all, it really begins with Christ in person. He says, come to me, all. Then he said, take my yoke upon you. This is the learner part. This is a personal choice. First one must decide to take this yoke. Christ invites those who believe to not just learn about him, but he says, learn from me. In other words, he, he says, I want you to learn directly from me. Paul says in Philippians 3.10, I want to know Christ. He, done, he did not want to just know about him. He wanted to know him personally, experientially. Discipleship is an ongoing process. It's an ongoing journey. It goes throughout the believer's life. And I just want to stop there for a second. I think we all understand this and we tell people that we're dealing with all the time, you know, that Christianity is not a religion. It's a relationship. It is an ongoing exchange between you and the living God. And, uh, what is this now? I just got a message here. You have logged in from another room. Can everybody still hear me? Give me a thumbs up if you can still hear me. Okay. Can you still see the screen? the slide okay um okay i just got this weird pop-up on my screen i'm like okay what is this anyway so 
it's about a relationship. We want to encourage people to learn not just the, the theology of Christ or the doctrine of Christ. We want people to learn Christ, to know him. Uh, and that's what it's all about. And I think we all understand that. Oops. All right. All right. The word follow or follower in the New Testament is taken from a word which also gives the meaning of way or path upon which one is walking. Thus, it carries the same meaning of somebody going along in the same way or, or the same path with someone else. It is a sure guarantee in biblical terms that the only way to be sent from Jesus with power and spiritual authority is to be with him, to be in his presence, and to follow him. Uh, this has a personal note for me. Uh, when I knew I was called to ministry, okay, so I'm now I'm back at shape. This is like in the mid 80s. And uh, we went from that chapel uh, ministry and I PCS'd and went to DC and I worked at the Pentagon for three years uh, for the Defense Intelligence Agency. And while I was there, we weren't, we weren't affiliated with ministry and military at that point. Uh, we were attending an Assembly of God church. Uh, the pastor there was a, a university professor, had been a university professor. His wife was a worship leader, and it was a great church. Um, but uh, I ran into some issues there. Because when I was coming up in that Kojic fellowship in the gospel service, um, there were a lot of strong brothers, and all we did was get into the Word. We talked about the Word. We related everything to the Word. It was always the Word, the Word, the Word, the Word. Uh, and God has kind of blessed me with the ability to recall Scripture, and so we would quote Scripture all the time. Uh, when I got to this AG church, uh, the pastor, for whatever reason, I, I felt discouraged in... Uh, in using the word all the time. I, I, I can't really explain that very well because I don't really understand what his motivation was. Um, but uh, I remember during that particular time, I was trying to be obedient to my pastor, and yet I knew what was in my heart in terms of the word, and I was feeling the call to ministry, but I didn't have opportunity for ministry. Um, I had been preaching in the, in the, uh, in the gospel service. And then when I got to the AG church, uh, I kind of had to sit down for a while. Um, there was a missionary that came through female missionary and, uh, she preached. I can't even remember what she preached, but I remember the altar call specifically. Um, because when I went to the altar that day, um, the Lord spoke to me cause I was struggling with this whole thing about the call and the qualifications for ministry. Um, my pastor was very much, uh, into education as a professor, you might think would be. Um, and he was working on his doctorate at the time. And, uh, I felt very inadequate, not having all of the formal education, but I had education in the spirit. And, uh, the Lord kind of confirmed that when I went to the altar that day, I'm weeping and crying, you know, got the snotty nose in the whole nine yards. The Lord said to me, uh, this whole thing about, I think it's in Acts 4.12, where it says, when the Pharisees and Sadducees heard and heard the wisdom and the, the boldness by which Peter and John spoke, uh, they marveled and they took knowledge that they had been with Jesus. And the Lord used that scripture and he said, you know, the only qualification there is for ministry is to have been with me. Is to have been with me. And that let me know there's nothing wrong with getting your education. My old pastor used to say, get your learning, but don't lose your burning. There's nothing wrong with that education, but you can have all the education in the world. But if you've not been with Jesus, if you've not spent time in his presence, if you've not had the opportunity for the Holy Spirit to impact you and conform you to the image of Christ, if you've not been saturated in the presence of God, then you don't really have what you need to be effective in ministry. But if you have that, even if you don't have a piece of paper on the wall, even if you don't have a credential on the wall, 
And I'm all about credentials. I like credentials. I have, I mean, I'm a bishop in the church of God. I have credentials. But the credentials are not my the are not the anointing. The paper is not the anointing. It's spending time in the presence of God. It's worshiping God. It's allowing, it's like that priest in the Old Testament that would go into the Holy of Holies and the the incense and the saturation of that atmosphere would permeate his clothes. And, and when he'd come out of that place, he would smell like God. He would smell like uh, the fragrance of Jesus. That's what we need. That is what we want to communicate to others uh, in the discipleship process, that we are following the Lord into all of the avenues that he leads us. And that's always going to invariably bring us into the presence of God. Um, and that's really the only qualification for ministry. I hope that's helpful. I just wanted to kind of share that because that's, that's what this slide is about. Um, to be with him, to be in his presence, is that is the Christian life. That is what we want to communicate to those that we disciple as we ourselves are being discipled. So, oops, I keep, I keep hitting the wrong button. I'm sorry. y'all. Okay. The, uh, I just want to uh, would like to say something that, that, yeah, that, that was do. awesome um, because um, you, 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 you're right on because a lot of people think that, Hey, you know, I'm not qualified to tell someone else about Jesus. Uh, it's, you know, everyone, you know, man has said that, yes, you need to have all this education in order to speak to someone else about Jesus. That's what people think anyway. Right. When you have the Holy Spirit in you and God has breathed in you, you know, his word, you can speak to anybody. Right. We're supposed to be going out discipling the people because, you know, they need to hear the word from someone. And, you know, you may not have the education that some other people have, but you have, you still have the word of God in you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people are afraid to step out on faith. They think they have to go get a, you know, a book you know, uh, in, in a classroom and sit behind a professor before they can speak to someone and they're kind of hindering their anointing and their flow in the, in the Holy Spirit, I think. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. You all are familiar with the passage, Acts 1-8, you know, mm -hmm. but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the world. That word, you all know, that word, witnesses, it's the Greek word martyrion, which means you will be martyrs. You will be those who live the crucified life before others so that they may see the witness of Jesus in you. And that's done by the power of the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, saturates you, fills you to overflowing, then you are a witness for Jesus, even to the point of death, even to the point of sacrifice. That's what the world is looking for. Somebody who really believes this thing and is willing to lay down their life, lay down their, their desires, lay down their, uh, their, uh, the things that they want to go for in life. doesn't matter what it is, whether it's, uh, education or fame or money or promotion or, you know, even a military career. I mean, you know, I know people that have gotten to where Tanya is right now, 19 years in the military and God said, get out. And they're like, no, <laughs> I only got a year left. But you know what? This, I'm not telling you that you have to get out, Tanya. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying, <laughs> I'm just saying that when we, if we're going to be disciples, we follow Jesus no matter what. Wherever the cloud moves, wherever it moves, that's where we go. Whatever the personal cost to us, that's what we must do. That's what a disciple is, a follower. We follow Jesus wherever he leads. That may not always be in a comfortable place, but it'll always be the best place. Can somebody say amen? Amen. <laughs> amen. I'm about to lose it over here, y'all. Oh, my gosh. This is some good stuff. I think that maybe because we're still under the open heaven and we're still, you know, so on fire from this fall retreat that we just had, but that is so, so good. I mean, I, I agree. It, it's amazing that we are able to get these qualifications. Cause like I said, I came under the church of God in Christ and we didn't have something that was quite like this. We still had to go through some training, but it, if you ask me what I had to do to get ordained in the Church of God in Christ, I'm going to say, mm, uh, 
so first we met with this person but it was nothing that was really structured like this so i'm all for the structured education and us coming on here and getting it but we can come to these things every single weekend with no anointing and still have no power right We lost you, Tanya, and it was good too. But you got a funny face up there. You locked up. <laughs> you still there? Looking for Tanya. Can everybody else hear me? okay we, 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 we can see you but we can't hear everybody or we can't see everybody else oh okay okay i guess because uh, i'm the host I, I can see everybody else but I, 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 tanya kind of froze up and the picture that i'm seeing is <laughs> it's hilarious all uh, right I'm, I'm sorry sister <laughs> but, um, <laughs> so um so hopefully Tanya will get back with us because what she was saying was very good um, and encouraging. So uh, if somebody's got you guys in Siganella, if you guys are text her, let her know that you know we're we're missing her. Okay, I see. Yeah, you got her there. All right. So I don't want to move. I don't want to move forward without everybody being here. If we can help it. All right. We need to rebuke the spirit to cut her off. What's that now? We need to rebuke the spirit that cut her off. <laughs> All right. Uh, Tanya's here. She just she drove over. Is your power out? Yeah. Okay. Her power just went out, so she just got here. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Oh, y'all must live, you must live like very close. We live down the street from each other. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm going to see, hang on a second. I'm going to see. Um, oh, there you are. Okay. Yeah, I had to come to get my power just now. That's okay. I was, I guess it's good now because the picture that I had of you, you were, I can't, I can't do it. But it when you when your power went out and froze, you had this really crazy look on your face. <laughs> you were like, <"Ooh." laughs> I can't do That's it. That's how I really look. <laughs> <laughs> oh goodness. All right. Well, I guess that's good that y'all are so close that you can just like pick right up like that. Okay. Door busting open. I'm like, like oh, I'm, the, the devil is a liar. I'm not, you know what? I'm excited. All right. I'm excited <laughs> too. I'm excited. <laughs> All right. So they're going to have, they're having fellowship at the Kex house. All right. We're going to continue to March. All right. Um, let's see here. Okay. Everybody still seeing the slide? Not seeing the slide? Yes, you're seeing the slide? Yes. Okay, good. Yes. Yes. All right, thank you. All right, here we go. All right, try to go. All right. It's so one thing to, oops. Back up, back up, back up. Okay. Here we go. It's one thing to receive one site as Bartimaeus did. It's a it is one thing to have a new conversion experience and to start off with Jesus, but it is another thing to follow him along the way. This is what Christian discipleship means. It means to walk in the same road with Jesus throughout one's entire life. It is a lifetime commitment of following Christ. Another connotation of following is the phrase to follow orders or to bring to full complete completion. You know, that concept should not be foreign to anybody associated with the military. We are to obey our orders, you know, in the absence of present, in the absence of further orders, we are to obey our, our last orders. Y'all remember your general orders? I don't know. None of y'all are, well, no, Brother Brian is Army, so you know your general orders, you know. 
guard everything within the limits of my post and quit my post only when properly relieved. We have not been relieved yet. So we're going to keep on keeping on. Um, there was one other thing I wanted to say. This is a personal thing. I like, <laughs> y'all don't judge me now, okay? I like kung fu movies. <laughs> uh, I have always liked kung fu I guess because I don't do kung fu that I like kung fu movies. I like watching other people being able to do that with such uh, grace and power and the motion and everything. And when you watch folks like in China that are in the Shaolin temples or you watch them out in the, in the square where, they're, where they have these large classes uh, of Kung Fu uh, adherents and people that are, are training, you always have one guy up front. He's doing the movements and all the other people are following behind and just imitating what they see. Um, the, the latest, uh, the latest version of the karate kid, the one with Jackie Chan and, uh, oh man, what's his name? The young boy. Aiden Smith. Thank you. Yeah. Will Smith's son. Right. If you've seen, if you've, if you've seen that movie, you remember there's a scene where, Jackie Chan is, is he's half drunk and he's discouraged because of what had taken place in his life. And Aiden Smith's character pulls him out of the car that he has now re-wrecked in his house. And he gets the, the sticks that they use to train and he slips them on his hands and he slips them on his own hands and they start moving in tandem with one another. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, have you all seen that movie? If you haven't seen the movie, this is not going to make a lot of sense. Okay, you have seen the movie. Good. So you know what I'm talking about. It's that it's that whole following the motion. That's what discipleship is. It's putting your hands in that stick and, and moving as Jesus moves. Where he goes, I go. Where he leads, I will follow. If he's if he's healing, I'm healing. If he's speaking, I'm speaking. As I want to remember Jesus said, I see, I do what I see the Father do. I speak the words that I've heard from my Father and declare them to you. That's really what discipleship is. Like we spend time with God, we move as he moves, we hear what he's speaking to us, we see what he's doing, and then we communicate that to others so that they can do the same thing. So I thought that was just a good illustration. All right, moving on. Following has the idea of continuing. It is an interesting fact that many books, magazines, seminars, conferences, and workshops are available on leadership, but very little exists on how to be a follower or what it means to be a good follower in order to become a good leader. That's very true. Uh, when I was in the Church of God in Christ, uh, one of the things that they always had you do when uh, you were a minister in training, which I was, uh, was to carry the pastor's briefcase. I don't know what's so special about the briefcase. You know, you get that briefcase, or when he's preaching, you make sure you get that glass of water up there on the platform. Tanya's nodding like, yeah, I, I'm, I'm there. You know, that's part of your training. You know, because you can't lead if you haven't learned how to serve. So, being a good leader means being a good follower first. We hear that in the military all the time. You know, they emphasize servant leadership. Well, the military did not come up with that idea or that concept. You have to go all the way back to Jesus <laughs> to find the model of servant leadership. Following him. To truly qualify for the designation disciple of Jesus Christ, one must follow him with exactness, trusting the rest of one's life to him. Uh, I want to read you a story here real quick. If I can find this story. Yeah. So this is a story. I'm just reading this story. Some years ago, uh, Dr. Manfred George Gutz, he was a school teacher. He said, I attended a meeting at which the speaker was a man who was acting as principal of a school attached to the New York Stock Exchange. This particular school is for the purpose of training the pages, the boys who run errands 
at the stock exchange. The boys are chosen from all over the United States and obviously are chosen only because they are the very smartest boys. They are put on a salary basis immediately and they draw full wages while they attend orientation courses at this school. The principal asked what we thought was emphasized in the courses during the period. We had no idea and yet we were surprised when he explained that the courses are especially designed to drill the boys to do exactly what they are told, exactly when they are told to do it. They have assignments that require them to do things at precise moments. They are given some simple thing to do at a minute and a half after 10 a.m., and they must do it right at that time. They are graded on their promptness and accuracy in carrying out details. And here's the interesting point. The principal went on to say that the biggest difficulty with these smart boys is that they find it hard to do exactly what they are told. They all have ideas of their own. I don't know about you, but I, I, I can relate to that because sometimes the Lord has told me something and I think, oh, well, I, I have, I'm like Ford. I have a better idea. And I try to do things maybe just with a little slight twist instead of doing exactly what he said. Well, maybe I could, you know, delay it or postpone it or say it a different way to kind of soften it up or whatever. And maybe you never had that kind of temptation, but I have. And the point here is that if we really want to be a follower, a disciple of Jesus, we have to learn to do what we're told exactly as we're told when we're supposed to do it. Now, you would think with a military background and dealing with military people that this would be a no-brainer. But I think if we're honest with ourselves, we have times where it's not always as easy as it sounds. Is, is it just amen or is it oh me? If it's oh me, that's fine. So uh, we, we must learn if we're going to be effective, if we're going to really be disciples, we need to do what Jesus said. Um, period. I, don't, I, can't, I can't really elaborate on that any further. We just need to be obedient. Um, I remember reading behind uh, David Young E. Cho. You know David Young E. Cho, pastor of the largest church in the world, Yoido Full Gospel in Seoul, Korea. They run over a million people in their church. Um, and I remember reading when he was asked um, what the secret of ministry was for him in his church. He said, I pray, I listen, I obey. <laughs> and he laughs, just he laughs funny like that. <clears throat> that sounds simple, and it is simple, but it's also very profound. He said, I pray, I listen, I obey. Would to God that all of us would do that consistently. Now, if you do, I tell you what, I will hand you the mic. <laughs> but I, I have my moments. I'll just be honest with you. I have my moments where I'm not always on point. Uh, but I am following. And one thing I have learned, at least this is my experience, is that the only thing I need to do to be victorious as a disciple is to get up one more time than the devil knocks me down. If I get up one more time than he tries to knock me down, I win. A righteous man falls seven times, the scripture says, and gets back up in Proverbs. So I'm still following. I'm still following. I want you to keep following. Those who you lead and minister to, encourage them to continue following, always, no matter what they go through, and to do it to the best of your ability with exactness and obedience. That's the standard. Okay. Uh, let's see. See, there it is right there. I pray, I listen, and I obey. A disciple is a learner and a disciple is a follower. Things are much better when believers let him be the teacher and they remain students. 
when believers let him be the leader, then they are the followers. Imitators. An imitator is one who imitates the example of another. Ephesians 5.1 states very straightforwardly, be imitators of God. Here's how God does the work in those who have answered the call of Jesus to come and learn. To be a learner and to come and follow, to be a follower. He, and he alone, implants the very nature of Jesus in believers when they are born again. And they are then what the apostle called in Christ. Here are the words of Jesus himself on the subject of imitating an example. A student <clears throat> is not above his teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like his teacher. So, believers can learn from Jesus, follow him, and imitate him in four dimensions. Service, sacrifice, suffering, and stride. We're talking about one's walk with God. And you can see the scriptures there posted on the slide. Um, again, if you want to get these, uh, these scriptures or the slides, just for review, uh, we can make those available to you at request. So a disciple is a learner, a follower, and an imitator of Christ. Anybody have any questions, comments, critiques, criticisms, anything like that? All right. Okay, so we're going to continue to march if y'all are good with that. Anybody need to take a break, go to the bathroom, do anything? All right. How we how we doing on time, uh, Tanya? All right. So, let's see here. All right. Computer's moving a little slow there. All right, so we're now we're going to transition to the next um, section, which is referring to the motivation of discipleship. So here we go. All right, get my gotta get myself together here. All right, do you guys still have the outlines for for that? Yes. Okay. All right. The classic discipleship invitation of, of Jesus is found in Matthew 20 and 11. Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He said, I will give you rest and you will find rest for your souls. Believers enter that rest. By accepting Christ's invitation, believers then experience a special abiding presence and a blessing of God over their lives by faith in Jesus Christ and by continuing in close relationship with him. So eight New Testament metaphors of discipleship. You can see those listed there. All those I'm sure are very familiar to you, but maybe you've not seen them in a list compiled like this. So there's images from the Old Testament. This first one is dealing with the potter and the clay. You all are familiar with that. Where Jeremiah was told by God, go down to the potter's house. I'm gonna speak with you there. And he gives him the words. And uh, so you all are familiar with that. Another image from the Old Testament is found in Malachi 3. But who can stand the day of his coming? When he, who can stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire. He will also be like a launderer's soap, soap that is cleaning away the impurities. I would love to preach on this passage, but we're going to move on. This is really good stuff right here. You, if you ever get a chance to study this out, um, this whole passage of, of God refining and purifying the ministry and purifying the priesthood, uh, it's a good passage. Excuse me, Warren. Can you go back just uh, two, two slides ago? One more. Okay. I'm just taking a picture. Nope, no problem. Thank you. You're welcome. Again, like I said, if you need these slides, uh, we can make them available to you. Uh, that would be great. Okay, okay. 
So what I did with the last term, last uh, 2017, 2018, um, we just posted these up. We have we have all of these uh, materials available on a Google Drive, and I can just put the link up on Facebook, and you can go and you can download those at any time. Okay. All right. All right. Direct challenges from Christ on discipleship. So He challenges us directly um, by looking at two things. One is His is our supreme love for Him and then putting on and taking off. So um, under this, first is a supreme love for Jesus Christ and a forsaking of all to follow him. In another passage in Matthew 16, there are three additional qualifications for being a disciple of Jesus. <clears throat> Denial of self, a deliberate choosing of the cross, and a continuing lifestyle of following Christ. You all are familiar with that passage. If anyone wants to be a disciple, he says he must you know, deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. That's what that's about. Second is putting on and taking off. The language of denying and taking up, putting on and taking off, is found in the New Testament in the books of Ephesians and Colossians. Ephesians 4, 22 to 24, says, You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. These continuing conditions are characteristics or marks of someone who has been, who truly has been born again and has put on the road to discipleship. Three things to make note here uh, of those continuing conditions, fervent love, fruitfulness, and continuance in his word. Uh, <clears throat> Excuse me. Each one of those has a lot of notes associated with it, but again, you'll get those uh, when we upload uh, to Google Drive. Um, discipleship is a wonderful journey. Indeed, it's an intensive, exciting, ongoing journey of faith. Anybody got any questions? Okay. It is so interesting because right now that's what we are doing, multiply. We're okay. doing multiply, starting in the church and with the church. Uh -huh. So this is perfect. Oh, well, good. I'm glad that it's relevant because we want to be relevant. All right. And in, in, in fact, when you talk about multiplying, that happens to be the next one that we're doing, that we're doing is multiplication of disciples. Let me get that slide deck coming up. All right. So, by the way, in terms of uh, multiplying disciples, Daniel, tell me what you guys are doing in your church uh, to facilitate the multiplication of disciples. One of the things that we are doing, uh, especially for multiply, and these are mostly church personnel, people that are coming to church already, is that we try to facilitate and rotate them to become a leader, even in being themselves the moderator or facilitator of that particular lesson. So that way they are not just listeners, but they are interactive and active with us together. Everyone gets a chance to fulfill that part. And on the other end, the outreaches that we do, we have an outreach and must await us me also next week to post it. We're gonna uh, outside of the church, we partner with different groups and like I said we do the bread ministry and so on but we're gonna do a cook-off for Filipino food and stuff we we'll try to to evangelize people and then bring them into into the service and another thing we are discipling we have three students from the European Theological Seminary which is part of the university here in Europe and uh, they are every second weekend three days with us we we'll try to implement the same thing live with us eat with us, and mentor them. Awesome. That's awesome. So when you talk about multiplication, you have a strategy. You have a plan that you're working. It doesn't just happen. It's not just 
something you do randomly or shooting from the hip. You have a strategy and a plan that you're working with the people that you intend to disciple, correct? Correct, it is intentional. Good, 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 good. And, uh, and that is true, discipleship cannot be happenstance. It has to be intentional. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting, and, and I'm sure you guys are familiar with this. When you look at Jesus's prayer in John 17, you know, we always refer to the Matthew 6 prayer where Jesus teaches his disciples to pray as the Lord's prayer. That's not really the Lord's prayer. That's the disciples prayer. The Lord's prayer is in John 17. And in John 17, one of the things that Jesus says in his prayer to the father, he says, you know, I have finished the work that you have given me to do. Now think about that for a second. He said, I've done what you've given me to do before he died on the cross. So what was it that God gave him to do that he finished before he laid down his life? I thought the son of man had come to seek and to save that which was lost. He came to lay down his life as a ransom for many. He came to give himself for the sins of the world. I thought that was his purpose. Well, that was, but Jesus had two purposes. He came to die on the cross, but he also came to train 12 men. The men that God, in fact, in his prayer, he said, of those that you have given me, I have lost none except the son of perdition that the scripture may be fulfilled. So Jesus's purpose for coming to earth was twofold. One, he has to die on the cross, but two, to train men to carry on the work that he started, that it would be perpetuated after he was gone. Um, if you look at the beginning of Luke, or excuse me, the beginning of Acts chapter one, he says, the former treatise, O Theophilus, I wrote to you concerning all that Jesus began to do and teach. So Jesus started it. He kicked it off. He was the, he's the prototype, the model of discipleship. And he is the one that started the whole thing, but he knew that he wasn't going to bring in personally the whole church. He said, you know, I've given, I've sent to you the Holy Spirit so that he can continue the work after I'm gone. I have to go away. And it's better for you if I do, because if I don't, then the Holy Spirit won't come. But if I could, but if I go away, the father will send him to you. And it's all about multiplying the disciples. You read through the book of Acts, and I, I don't know about you, but sometimes I just marvel at some of the things that go on. And I know that God can do the same thing today that he did then. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Um, but sometimes we don't always see 3,000 people getting saved in a single service, 5,000 people getting saved in a single service. Um, the number of disciples, you know, growing and, and the, the word of God being exponential. We may not see that in our, in our immediate context. It's happening worldwide for sure, but we may not see it in our immediate context. But I long for the day when God explodes and we see like hundreds and thousands of people come to Christ in our context. Um, God can do that. And the thing about it is even when they come to Christ, we still have the responsibility of shepherding them, discipling them, so that, the, as uh, Sister Brian was talking about, that we make disciples who make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. Right? You don't want it to die off with us. It's not supposed to. That's not what Jesus came to do. He said, I will build my church. You all know it. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That means that the church should be advancing against the gates of hell, not sitting in a fortress with, with hell coming against us. We should be moving forward against hell and seeing people saved, set free, and discipled. Okay, I'm going to stop preaching now. We're going to move on because I know Tanya's got to go. <laughs> All right, so multiplying disciples. Four balanced dimensions of human growth and development. Jesus was about 12 years of age when he went to the temple with his parents. The Bible says that he was there in the temple asking questions, learning, speaking, and talking with the elders. When the time came for his parents to come and find him, he obediently went back home to Nazareth with them. He was subject to them. He was a good follower before he became a good leader. As a young person, Jesus grew in four dimensions. This key passage found in Luke 2.52 says, Jesus grew in wisdom and stature, 
and in favor with God and men. Four areas. And as we go through this, this will resonate with, with everybody because I mean, we don't have any Air Force, Air Force folks in this particular group. But they're always talking about the, the pillars, the, the pillars of, uh, of uh, leadership. And this is where that comes from. Humans grow mentally, physically, spiritually, and socially. These four dimensions are really answered in the model of, how, of Jesus Christ and how he grew. He grew in wisdom. That would be the mentally. He grew in stature. That would be physically. I'm sorry. Yeah. He grew in favor with God. That would be the spiritually. He grew in favor with men. That would be the social part. Biblical models of that kind of development. Nehemiah was rebuilding the walls. They rediscovered the word of God. In a way, they were restarting their discipleship commitments and their obedience to the word of God. Likewise, when there has been a faltering or a slacking or a little bit of slowing down in one's own personal discipleship, there is always a point for a renewal, for rediscovery, for refreshment in the word of God. One can then move forward to a new dimension of discipleship as one discovers the power of the word of God. And we've kind of talked about that already in the group, you know, as we have related our personal discipleship experiences. It's always been focused on the word. Um, I learned that. I learned that very early on, you know, when you're in a counseling session or you are discipling someone, don't give people your opinions. <laughs> give them the word. It's all about the word. You can give them opinions about the word. Okay, that's fine. But give them the word of God. That's what's, going to, that's what's going to do the job. Nehemiah 8 is a model of how to multiply disciples and train others for discipleship by discovering the principles of the word. Here are the steps. So there's several different steps. Number one, bring out the book. Set a time to have Bible study. Are you guys familiar with the Nehemiah 8 passage where they have revival? in the days of Nehemiah, and they rediscover the book of the law in the temple of God, and they bring it out, and they make a platform uh, specifically for that purpose, and they gather the elders, the leaders, the scribes up on the platform, and then they gather all the people around. It's, it's a time of revival and restoration, and when they open the book, everybody stands up, and they begin to worship the Lord, and they read the book for like three or four hours in the day, and they worship and praise God, and uh, and then they read some more and they worship and praise God. And they were, and they continually uh, were teaching the people. You're all familiar with that passage? Hello. <laughs> so y'all are familiar with that, right? Okay. So they brought out the book. They opened the book. The Bible, the word of God is open and believers must follow it and live their lives from this open book. Third thing, read the book. Ezra brought out the book. He opened the book. He read the book. I mean, this is kind of basics for us. I know you guys know and understand this. You're established in these truths. But this is a good pattern. These, uh, these five steps are really good. Like if you're discipling someone else or you're looking for a structure like Daniel and like Danny and Emma are, are doing, you know, a structure for discipling. This is, this is a good model, a good structure for you to follow. Third, read the book. Fourth, explain the book. The Bible says that they explain the book, making it clear. You might, uh, whether it's a Bible study, whether it's expository preaching, uh, whether it's inductive study, um, whatever your method is, um, you want to make sure that people have an understanding of what is being read. Uh, one of the tools that I've used in our ministry is um, uh, the Navigator's Bible study stuff, if you're familiar with that. I think that is some really solid Bible study material because a lot of stuff that you'll find out there, they tell you what to think. They give you commentary and then a little bit of Bible verses and stuff like that. With the Navigator's studies, they just ask you questions. They ask you open -ended, some open-ended questions, some closed-ended questions, but they don't tell you what they think. They teach you how to study the Bible. They, they give you scriptures. They'll ask you a question, just fill in the blank, and then you have to draw your own conclusions based on personal discovery. And, you know, if you, if you learn something 
uh, on your own as opposed to somebody telling you and you just kind of absorbing it, you'll retain it a whole lot better. That's just basic learning 101. And you know that you uh, really comprehend a subject and understand it well if you're able to explain it to somebody else in a way that they can understand it. So one of the things that uh, I try to do, and I think, I'm, I think I'm fairly good at it, is to make the complex simple. If you can do that um, when explaining particularly spiritual truth, deep spiritual truth, um, then you know that you have a good handle on it. Jesus is the master at this, and he always did it by telling stories. He would say, you know, the kingdom of heaven is like, and he would tell a story. He would tell a parable. Um, and that's how he would make the complex simple. Um, and he also did things in a developmental way. Remember, he told his disciples, he said, I have many things to say to you right now, but y'all can't handle it yet. But when the Holy Spirit comes, he's going to explain everything to you. So you have to. So you have to open the book, you have to read the book, you have to explain the book, and you have to do it in such a way that people get it so that, you know, the light bulb comes on. And then when the light bulb comes on, then you know that you've done what you uh, have set out to do. And of course, lastly, we don't want just information. We want to live what we've learned. Five, live by the book. This is the fifth and final step in the model that we live by the book. We don't just want to be uh, repositors of truth. We want to be examples of truth. So there's four key words that will help believers learn how to approach the word, to learn from it, to transfer it on to somebody else. Uh, first word is familiarize. An individual who wants to teach it or preach it or preach from it or have a Bible study and disciple others needs to get thoroughly acquainted with that biblical passage, reading it again and again in preparation. You guys have ministered long enough. You all know how to do Bible study. You learn the scripture. You get the context. You know what the who, what, where, when, why, and how. Um, those kinds of things. If you really want to be able to explain the scripture, you know, you must be familiar with, with it in all of the different aspects. Uh, B is to find. Find a basic structure or a basic pattern. Uh, case in point. Um, if you read through the book of Romans, for example, um, Paul, he has a method in which he explains truth. He layers truth upon truth. And if you read through the book of Romans, you'll see he will make a theological statement and then he'll say, therefore. And you always have to ask yourself, what's the therefore, therefore? Right? So uh, when he explains it, he will uh, explain the truth and say, therefore. And then he gives you the practical application of that truth. And you will find that pattern repeated over and over and over through the book of Romans. So that's a basic structure that will help you understand what Romans is all about. Another good example is the book of Ephesians. Um, Ephesians has six chapters. The first three chapters, Paul is primarily um, giving theological truth. He's telling us about our relationship in Christ, our position in Christ, uh, how we are seated with Christ in heavenly places, how we are uh, positionally sanctified, how we are positionally exalted, um, all of those kinds of things in Ephesians, the first three chapters. Then the next two chapters, four and five, he gives us the, um, the practical application. How, what does that mean? Now, in light of that truth, what does that mean in our everyday Monday to Sunday living? You know, how should we treat one another? How should we relate to the world? How should we understand uh, the world around us? And then in chapter six, of course, he caps it off and tells us, you know, how we are to stand after we have, after we found out how we are seated in Christ and who we are in Christ. And then we find out how we are to walk in Christ, chapters four and five. Then now we learn in chapter six how to stand in Christ. And so there's a structure there that we can learn. And those, those structures, as we observe them, as we read through the scriptures, you'll see that. And then that will give us uh, a way to um, better teach, better uh, disciple others, and to explain the word of God uh, in a way that makes sense. I hope I just did that <laughs> in a way that makes sense. Um, so we find that, and that just, that, that means we have to dig, we have to study, we have to learn. Uh, we need to focus, uh, find, 
ideas uh, that are focused on keywords and phrases. Um, I just kind of rolled that up into what I just explained. Uh, formulate, perhaps the most important part of this approach to discipleship training is to formulate key principles and applications of scripture. Um, I'll give you one quick example. In Nehemiah, um, when, the, when, the, when the workers are on the wall and uh, they are being threatened by the, the people around them and they're trying to discourage them in building the wall, Nehemiah encourages and exhorts the people and tells them, say, you know, you need to remember the Lord and fight for your sons, for your daughters uh, and your homes. And so it says that they went on the wall, they built the wall, they had a sword in one hand and a building tool in the other. And uh, they would swap out day and night and, and exchange, uh, you know, shifts and things like that. So that's a truth of scripture. But there are principles about that that we can, ex that we can extract as well, whether you're talking about fighting while you're working and how that how that translates to um, what we do when we are working, uh, that we need to always be prepared for war because that there are enemies that are going to come against us while we're trying to do the work of God. Um, there's when I was when I was more politically active, and that's a whole other story. There, um, this is one of those scriptures that talk about the biblical right of self-defense, that we have um, a right and a duty to defend our homes, to defend our families from invasion and things like that, just as they did in those days. Those are principles. And that, that's one of the things that you want to learn as you're studying the word. You see those key principles, you see those applications, uh, you want to be able to translate that to um, to how we should live. I hope that makes sense. I know I'm kind of kind of, I feel like I'm kind of all over the map there, but um, I'm hoping I'm making some sense. Kind of hard to tell because y'all are looking at me like I just grew three heads, but that's okay. <laughs> all right. Oh, I just hit the wrong button again. Okay, here we go. How Jesus and the Early Church Made Disciples. Robert Coleman in his book called The Master Plan of Evangelism. By the way, I have this book. I've read this book. It's a great book. You need to pick it up if you don't already have it in your library. Uh, outlines a pattern of how Jesus took his disciples through this process of multiplication. It is actually a series of eight particular keywords. And so I'm just going to go through these real fast. Selection. Jesus chose 12 disciples. Association. Jesus associated with his disciples and stayed with them during his earthly ministry. That's the part Danny was talking about. You know, you hang out with people, you eat with them, you spend time with them, and they become like you. Consecration. Christ required obedience from his disciples. Impartation. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Demonstration. Christ said in John 13, I have given you an example. Um, delegation. He says, I will make you fishers of men. And again, Danny talked about that, you know, giving people something to do, give, getting them a chance to rotate, getting experience. Supervision. He kept a close check on them. He supervised them. And then eight, reproduction. He said to his disciples, go and bring forth fruit. He expected them to reproduce. When I was coming up through MIP many, many moons ago, the way that it was taught uh, when Christ was teaching his followers, there were four specific things he said. Uh, I do, you may have heard this before. I do, you watch. I do, you help. You do, I help. You do, I watch. Have y'all heard that before? Okay. And that's how Christ, that, that's how Christ did it. That's how I know sometimes in the military, they, they, do that you know uh in training the trainer uh you watch how i do it and then you try it i'm going to supervise you now you try it i'm and 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 i'm going to watch and see how you do and make corrections on the spot and then i'm going to cut you loose and you got it and that's a good pattern it works okay anybody got any questions Yes. Can you repeat that, please? That pattern. Oh, yes. Okay. Oh, let me let me take off the screen share for a second. Hang on.
Is that? Oh, you know what? I didn't even share the screen, did I? No. Uh -uh. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay, we have to start all over. No. <laughs> I'm up here just running through the slides. I thought y'all should see that. I'm like, what? Okay. Fail. All right. Um, so the pattern is this. This is how Jesus, let me just, let me, i tell you what I'm going to do. Let me bring up this last few slides. And then, uh, and I will share this. So hang on for a sec. Okay. All right, here we go. Is that better? Okay. Yeah. Yes. All right. So there's the, there's the steps. Selection, association, consecration, impartation, demonstration, delegation, supervision, and reproduction. You know, people, um, people that make up these notes, they like alliteration. I don't know why people like alliteration. You know, they try to make everything sound the same. I guess it's a memory aid, you know, to help. So the four steps that I learned is this. Okay, so Jesus said to his disciples, I'm going to do, you watch. And so that's what happened when Jesus called his disciples. They followed him and they saw the miracles that he did. They heard him teach. They learned the doctrine. I, I do, you watch. And then he said, I, uh, I do, you help. So Jesus went around to all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness and disease among the people. And then in the next chapter in Matthew 10, it says that he sent out his disciples two by two. He sent them out to preach <clears throat> and to heal the sick and to cast out demons. And he gave them instructions on how to do it. And they went out and they did what Jesus did and came back and reported. And Jesus still didn't, he didn't stop working. He was still doing, he was still teaching. And the disciples were still learning. So that was the I do, you help phase. Then the third phase is you do, I help. So that's when Jesus started to um, back up more from actually doing uh, the hands-on ministry. And he was doing more of the teaching and preparing himself to go to Jerusalem to die on the cross. And the disciples were doing more of the hands-on ministry. And then the fourth one is, uh, you do, I watch. So again, so I do, you watch, I do, you help, you do, I help, and you do, I watch. So the whole idea is shifting the risk. And Daniel, you talked about that, giving people the opportunity to do ministry. They see other people doing ministry. They imitate what they see. They get opportunity to do it themselves. They get the training that they need. And then you cut them loose with some supervision, you know, to help refine and fine tune that process and, and what they're doing. And then you can release them and launch them into ministry. That's, that's the process. I know in the military, we are familiar with that. It's the whole train the trainer concept. Um, but that's, that's how we make disciples. We just do it in spiritual things. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. So in terms of the slides, okay, so y'all just watch the screen real quick, okay? Okay. Okay, now you can say you've seen the slides. <laughs> I told you, God tried to try to get y'all out of here pretty quick. Okay. Anybody got any questions? So we've covered uh, the Declaration of Faith, Articles 1 and 2. We've talked about uh, discipleship, talked about the, the meaning of discipleship, the motivation of discipleship, uh, and the 
multiplication of disciples. Um, we had a chance to share, to uh, give our experience. Um, does anybody have anything that they would like to share in conclusion? Y'all ready to go eat dinner? I know over there in Siganella, it's dinner time. Uh, yes, we have. I can't hear anybody. <laughs> you got to unmute your mic. Can you hear us? Now I can, yes. I don't have anything to share, but I, I am going to step out. Okay. Well, thank you for coming. Now you don't have to watch the recording. All right. God bless you. Um. If it's okay, I would like to add on. Um, our family got hit by the hurricane and houses. A lot of my family and friends are all destroyed. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because I wanted to take time and pray. We've got we've got evacuees here as well. Um, yeah. So and They're I feel, all from Panama City. Yeah, and I'm feeling I'm feeling particularly um, a burden for them because. I was here when Katrina hit in Mississippi, you know, 13 years ago. And I know that kind of devastation. I mean, I had just arrived in Mississippi. I had been here less than a year and everything was just gone. I mean, thank God we didn't lose our house, but I lost my shed out back through a tornado. And our church at the time was Church of God became um, a center for uh, people that were homeless, for um, uh, work crews that were coming to help try to rebuild and things like that. And it did it. I mean, you've seen the pictures on, on online and on the news. It looks like a nuclear explosion went off. I mean, that's how it looked here. Um, roads destroyed houses, <clears throat> and particularly in the heat of summer, uh, you know, generators and ice were precious commodities. Uh, during that time. So we want to take a moment and pray not only for your family and, and loved ones, but for everybody down there. Um, yeah. it's, it's a difficult, difficult thing. Um, please. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, so we're going to do that. Uh, just as we, as we close out, uh, last thing, anybody got any questions about any of the material we've covered today? <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay. All right. Well, I want to thank y'all for coming. We're going to close out in prayer. We're going to remember the folks down in Florida and Georgia. Um, there's a lot of folks that are, are experiencing problems because of Michael, Hurricane Michael. Uh, so, yeah, let's just let's just take a moment and pray. Our Father and our God, we, we are thankful that we can come to you in prayer today. We thank you that you've given us the privilege, Lord, as priests in your house to pray and to intercede, oh Lord, on behalf of others. And that we do so, Lord, knowing that we have been ourselves cleansed by the blood of Jesus and that we can come with boldness before the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Lord, we stand in the gap right now for those people, Lord, that are in Florida and Georgia and every place, Lord, where this hurricane has come through and devastated people's lives and homes and property. And some have even lost their lives. God, we want to stand before you, Lord. There, there are even people that may be blaming you for what has taken place, Lord. But we know that you are good and that your mercy endures forever. Lord, we lift up these people. We ask God for your mercy. We ask for your grace to be given to help in this time of need. We pray for the families that particularly, Lord, those that are our brothers and sisters there or those that are our, our, our blood family that are there, as Ashley had mentioned, Lord, we pray for them. We pray that you would strengthen them. We pray that you would comfort them. We pray that you would help them to recover. 
We pray for their peace, that you would give them peace in the midst of this situation. God, we pray that, that even though times may be difficult, that they may find joy in your presence. We pray that you would provide, Lord, for all of the needs of the people that are there that, so that they can rebuild and restore. And we pray, Lord, that, that you would take this situation, as tragic as it is, and somehow turn it for your honor and glory, that people in these affected areas would come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. We pray earnestly, Father, that what, the, what, what may be in, had been meant for evil, that you would turn around and turn it into something good, that you would reverse the curse, that you would make it a blessing, that, Father, your your purposes, your kingdom purposes in the midst of this tragedy would be accomplished in the name of Jesus. We, we, we pray, Lord, for the churches that are there, that, that in, this, in, in times like this, Lord, this is when your people can shine the best, shine the brightest, that they could be the beacons of hope. They could be the conduits of your grace and your love. And we pray that you would help them to do that. The opportunity is there. We pray, Lord, for divine appointments for your people in that area to speak so that even though people may have lost property, they may not lose their souls. Because it doesn't matter, Lord, what we have in this world if we lose our souls. So we pray for that. We ask you, Lord, to intervene, to stretch forth your hand and to heal, to do signs, wonders, miracles in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you that you are still in control, that you still are on the throne. Nothing that has happened or will happen escapes your notice, escapes your control, your hand. And Lord, in the midst of all of this, particularly for Ashley's relatives and friends and for all of those, Lord, that we know, may they find a place of trust in you. May they find that place in Christ where they say, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away, blessed be the name of the Lord. We thank you for that, God. We thank you for that. Now, Lord, I pray for a blessing for every one of the interns, Lord, here, MIP, Lord, for, for all of their families, Lord. I pray for their strength for their encouragement in the Lord, that you would help them in their ministries, that you would uh, help them to stay on task and finish all of the requirements for the course and to do well, to do very well, not just academically, Lord, but that there would be spiritual growth, real spiritual fortitude and growth, Lord, that would take place in their hearts, that they would not just get the information, but they would have transformation that their lives, their families, their ministries would be blessed. Father, I pray for provision for every one of them, that they would know no lack, uh, but that all of their needs would be supplied. And above that, Lord, that you would provide handfuls on purpose, uh, that as they are delighting themselves in you, that you would give them the desires of their heart. And that, Lord, your, your blessing, your favor would rest upon them. I thank you, Lord. I commit them into your hands. Uh, use them for your honor, for your glory. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, I've had fun. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I've had fun. <laughs> um, so y'all can turn your mics on, please, because I like I like somebody. To, I don't just want to hear crickets. I don't want y'all to talk to me. Thank you. <laughs> um, have you found this helpful? Okay. I just want to say, I just want to say that we found this to be extremely helpful. Um, um, thank you so much for taking your time out of your busy schedule to share with us. We've learned so much. I can just listen to you for hours. Oh. Um, because as I said before, you know, evangelism and the discipleship is a passion of ours, and we've just learned uh, so much. And so we're excited to be a part of the MIP program. We're appreciative of, of you sharing with us. I mean, 
each time you spoke and showed a slide, I think we got even more excited and even more on fire for God. So even though we weren't saying anything, we were just taking it all in and just learning, learning and just thinking how we can go back out now and apply what we learned today, even you know more so um, now that we've learned um, uh, new, uh, have insight, better insight on discipleship and uh, um, um, evangelism. So we're excited. So thank you so much. Oh, you're um, welcome. What an you, honor and a privilege. Well, I appreciate you saying that. I should have learned this lesson a long time ago, but I, uh, I guess this is the human part of me coming out. You know, when I preach or I teach or I share, I like to get feedback. I like, even if you just say amen or something, but when I was, uh, when we were pastoring, uh, I would, for example, I'd preach a sermon on a Sunday afternoon and uh, the congregation would just be sitting there looking at me like a calf at a new gate, you know, like this. And I'd get a little, I'd get a little nervous. And uh, I, I would say something to the congregation. There was this one sister, her name is Annette Marcano. If she ever sees this video, she'll kill me. Uh, she would sit there, precious Hispanic sister. She would just sit there. She'd say, you know, pastor, we're just, we're just chewing. We're just chewing. Just chewing. And, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, okay, I, I, I'll receive that, <laughs> you know? <Yeah. laughs> So that's, that's, I, I should know that, but every once in a while I'd like, okay, y'all talk to me, please. Don't let me yeah. feel, don't let me monologue, okay? You just couldn't hear us, but we were all saying amen. And, <laughs> and dogs were like, yes. we were all saying, and I promise you just couldn't hear us. Okay. Yeah. okay. Good stuff. Good stuff. Okay, good. good. I, uh, I wish I could give you like everything I've got. I mean, I've, after, you know, 30 years of doing this, uh, I've collected a lot of different things, so you know. We're thirsty for more. <laughs> okay, well, I'll be back in section in seminar three. Yes. Um, I'll be back. I'm doing just the declaration of faith piece. Yeah. Um, so maybe we'll take a little extended time and visit a little bit, and you guys can answer, ask me some questions. I'll be glad to share with you anything. Um, I don't have any secrets. Well, yeah, I do have something. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there's some things I'm not going to tell you, but you know, uh, in so, terms of the word and ministry and stuff like that, yeah, just ask me anything. Uh, you know, I want to help. I want to, I want to pour into you as much as I can. So, um, yeah. So, will you put the slides out online as well as the yes. recording so we can listen yes. to it again? Yes, I will. Um, uh, we have a YouTube channel okay. um, that I will post the videos to. I got to get them you know, uh, converted and uploaded. And so I will post the links on the Facebook page, uh, to the YouTube video, as well as to all the slides and the notes and the outlines, everything that I have, you all will get. So you can go back yeah. and review it. And, uh, I don't, I'm, I'm not trying to, uh, there's no, there's no job security with this. I'm not trying to keep anything to myself. Okay. So you'll get everything I got. Good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anything else? You have been amazing. Thank you very much. Okay, yeah. you're welcome. You're very welcome. Enjoy it, man. All right, cool. Then we will see you. Um, well, somebody will see. Won't be me, but somebody will see you in November for seminar two. Um, just make sure you try and keep up on your assignments and your, you know, all the stuff that you got to do. I don't even know because I don't have a, a book. It's changed so much since I went through. So um, I pray God's blessing on each and every one of you. Enjoy your rest of your Saturday. And uh, we, I will see you back in December for Seminar 3. All right? Good. All right. God bless. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.